Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, friends and foes alike. I am the West Virginia woman, Robin Holstein of RobinHolstein.com and Holstein House, where my guests get a good night's sleep at a fair rate, plus breakfast. I've been keeping house since I was 17 years old, balancing the budget and paying the bills as an army wife on the salary of a PFC stationed at Fort Hood, Texas, and as a single mother of two back home in West Virginia. Things have changed a lot since then, but I haven't forgotten what it was like. This podcast looks at society and cultural issues affecting families in West Virginia and in the United States, from food preparation and storage, gardening, home repairs, current events, and more. We'll go round the table and back in 60 minutes or less. So let's hang out and talk a while. Well, good morning, good morning. It's a bright and early morning here in this little community in West Virginia, Kanawha County, West Virginia. <coughs> Once again, we've got the sinus drainage going on. <laughs> I know you wanted to hear about that. I know you've been waiting for an update on the fact that I have sinus issues. And no, I know you don't really. But that that is a partial explanation for the uh, differences in the sound of my voice some days. It's a little more, oh, B. Arthur than others. For those of you who ever watched either Golden Girls or Maud or some of those shows, <clears throat> B. Arthur was an actress. She was rather tall and she had a fairly deep voice for a, for a woman. Um, and sometimes when I have some of my sinus or allergy issues, I get this very grainy, deep um, sound to my voice, uh, and and I I call it my my B Arthur voice. So there you go. It's really early, and I I apologize, and this is probably very unprofessional, but I apologize for the odd uh, uploads they I really had wanted to target Tuesdays and Thursdays and then I thought well that's kind of close there's only a day in between there's not a lot going on here in uh, in a 24-hour period of time so I was experimenting with some other days and then life because you know this isn't my profession I don't make a living at content creation or podcasting or my YouTubes. They're things that I like to do, things that I like to share. Would I like to get a large following of, you know, internet friends and, you know, have a regular schedule? Yeah, that's that's a goal. Um, as I work through schedules and adjusting things, it's probably not going to happen as regularly as I would like. That's why you need to be subscribed or you need to like, depending on the platform that you are he hearing this on or perhaps viewing me when I do live uh, uh, videos, then, you know, that way you know, that way you know. And um, I'm going to try, I mean, I'm going to keep, keep at this for a good while before I decide whether it's working or not. But um, last in the past seven uh, seven days or so, you know, I had the surgery on my eye, which went fine. Went fine. The stitches are finally out. Um, kind of uh, coerced them out a little bit because you're supposed to keep, you know, Vaseline on them to keep them moisturized so that they don't dry out and pull and tear the skin and worsen any scarring and all that stuff. And they come out easier. So they were working their way out. They were itching me to death and poking me in the corner of the eye. And I just kind of helped them along maybe a day or so early. But in the meantime, I went down and got my flu shot. And I don't normally have trouble with the flu shot. I I have been taking it for many years, every year. I don't... Um, I kind of see the flu shot as separate from some of the government conspiracy theories about the... Rona vaccinations that are just worthless in my opinion. 
and um, I began taking them when my younger son, my younger son was the son that he committed suicide and was, he'd been born prematurely, very prematurely. I was only six months along. He was a pound nine ounces, so um, very well undeveloped, and it's just, a, he was a miracle and a gift from the Lord that uh, he made it at all, much less to live as long as he did. But um, so when he was very tiny, uh, his pediatrician requested or suggested, I should say, because he couldn't have forced me anyway, that we make sure everyone in the household had the flu vaccinations because especially in his first three or four years, his immune system would constantly be playing catch up and he would be more susceptible because he had a little spot of damage in his lung from being intubated for uh, 99 days almost. And um, it would be harder on him if he got the flu. And at that time, the flu was the basic one that you could vaccinate yourself against. Um, and so I started getting the flu vaccination then, and we would get them uh, around, or he would get his in early October. Um, I would usually get mine in November, and you know the rest of the family. Well, my older my older son according to whatever the pediatrician suggested for him. But um, to shorten that story a little bit, I went up uh, Friday and got my flu vaccination. And I don't remember um, a, a flu vaccination bothering me as much as this one has in the past. Um, I've had sore arm and I've had, you know, the spot where you get the shot get inflamed before. But I've never had my lymph nodes uh, in the in the arm that I got the vaccination to get inflamed and I got the vaccination in the right arm and by Saturday afternoon the lymph nodes in my right arm were starting to swell a little bit being inflamed and um, and on, on Saturday, I spent a, a good amount of time uh, just kind of sitting because I had a terrible headache. And um, I had woke up early. I almost always wake up early. And then sometimes I can go back to sleep. And sometimes I can't. But I had been awake for a long time, decided to go ahead and get off, get up, and started my um, morning routines a little bit that you could that early. And then I just kind of got hit with such a headache that I sat down and then I felt bad. So I laid down on the couch, covered up and slept for a couple more hours, which is odd for me. I don't usually go back to bed. And so I don't, I don't know. I don't want to get conspir conspiratorial with this and think, well, the only thing that has changed since my last flu vaccination was the Rona updates. And, but that's kind of not true because we got those a year ago, started those a year ago, but I did have one of the boosters. And I, again, I don't, I don't want to try to go down those rabbit holes because you can't prove one or the other. You can only look around at the evidence and, um, and decide, well, there seems to be a pattern. And I don't personally know anyone else that has had similar reactions to the flu shot unless they just didn't mention it or I didn't hear them say it or I didn't see them say it on social media. My husband went and got his yesterday so it's a little early for him to know whether he's going to feel bad if it's going to happen the same way it happened with me. And it could also be a combination of the uh, surgery I had on my eye Tuesday. Maybe I should have waited a little while before I got the flu vaccine and um, you know, too much trauma to the old body here. I don't know. But so I, I didn't get the, the, <laughs> the whole point of that conversation is that I, I didn't get the recording done uh, when I wanted to get it recorded and get it posted. But, you know, you're going to have that. It's life. And it's real life. And it's happening in real time. So, um, uh, this is the 14th episode of the Holstein House podcast, premiering on the Fountain Network. And if you found me on Fountain, or really if you found me anywhere, 
checklist. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't be listening if you weren't listening. I hope you'll boost and clip and share with all your friends and followers. And and if I bring you something of value, I hope you share value in return. Um, I know there are some other uh, platforms out there. And, you know, you can share value if you can't share it, say, with sets. You can share it with likes. You can share it by uh, sharing the fact that the podcast is there. Share the link with some of your friends. Share a comment, a positive comment that, hey, you know, this was a good one. Or, I, you know, that I didn't like this one. But some interaction. You know, if you can't share a sat, some great positive interaction would be, would be greatly appreciated. Um, you know, so... Um, <laughs> There are, I, I'm constantly bombarded with these dumb commercials, and you are too. Maybe you tune them out, maybe you look at them and say, hmm. Some of my <laughs> earliest, <laughs> earliest ones that come to mind, because you see all these things on television. When I was growing up, there used to be Ronco and KTEL records, and they would have the um, top pop songs, and they would make albums of them, that I think it'd be five or eight on each side, and you'd buy them, and it'd be you know, top twenty love songs, or or you know, top beach songs and and things. Then, uh, so you, you you would see them on television advertised, you know, the KTL album, this that and the other, and you know, go to Kmart and buy it. And, or and the one that sticks to my mind is the Ginsu knives, and they were the the ultimate never needed sharp they could cut through a tin can and then slice a tomato very thinly um, they were made in Japan of high tensiled steel and all this stuff and so it was it probably wasn't the first well I also remember you know there used to be in the back of comic books or some magazines targeted towards younger people or, or Grit, you know, I remember Grit magazine, you, you could buy, I, I sent off, and at that time you could actually send currency, dollar bills, and change, I don't think you were supposed to, but you could do it, through the post office, and I sent a dollar in an envelope one time and ordered this, this real life ghost to hang in your tree at Halloween, and what I got back was a balloon, a length of, uh, uh, fishing line and a white trash bag. <laughs> so you would see these advertisements for these too good to be true things, and of course you're a kid, and and you went ahead and you fell for it, and you did it anyway, and you know. <laughs> but um, what's bringing this up is is you know I'm sitting here Saturday feeling bad and watching television. And commercials are coming on for all of these products, and some of them are kitchenware. Uh, we, we've been through the, the the copper craze, and we've been through the granite craze, and the and the diamond craze. Well, back in the day, it was Teflon. You know, Teflon was the greatest thing since sliced bread, and and you were gonna save so much time with your thin bimetal pans that are coated with Teflon, and everything was sliding off. Very similar to the stuff that they're showing today, except that this Teflon, and Teflon is, I think, a registered trademark for a product, and I don't, you know, I have no intention of breaking any trademarks or copyright or whatever. I use that phrase the same way we, we tend to use the phrase or the word Band-Aid when we're talking about generic bandages. Band-Aid is a brand name trademarked and all that stuff and but we we use it generically and that's what I'm doing with the with the, with the Teflon it was a coating and it, it was on um, skillets and pots and pans and things it's supposed to make life a lot easier but what happened is people at when that came out you you tended to have uh, aluminum or um, some sort of metal utensils that you know uh, spatulas and spoons and things that you used in your pots and pans well these metal utensils would scratch the Teflon and it would eventually flake off and it would flake off into your food and you may not have noticed it for years until you thought wait a minute there's a big piece of Teflon where did that go 
So you would end up eating it, you know, and it just toxic, toxic stuff. Um, and so it's, you know, there were lawsuits and stuff because DuPont made it and all oh, it was awful. And, and I'm sure it didn't make a lot of people sick. But, you know, now, now the thing is, is this granite ware and all this, um, new type new fangled cooking surfaces that everybody go oh, you gotta have it it's christmas time gotta buy buy somebody a whole set of this stuff and you know <laughs> everyone wants this stuff this lighter than air cookware diamond infused granite copper all stainless all all this hyped up for the holidays right now but i'm a proponent and and have been for a long time and honestly even when I was first married, living in Texas, at 17 years old, which is very true, I, I got married at 17, and my husband and the father of my children, all of my children, was uh, four years older. He was 21, and by today's standards, he could be put in jail. But <laughs> anyhow, um, we lived when we moved to Texas. Uh, when he was in the Army, after he got out of basic training, we moved down to Fort Hood, Texas. We lived off post because, you know, the Army doesn't issue you a family. And when you have a family, you don't get to live on post until you've achieved a little bit of rank and had a little bit of investment into the military. And they feel like it's it's worth their time and effort to put you on base. Plus, if an opening comes up. But we had this really, really nasty little apartment. And it, but at the time, you know, you're young and in love and it's your first place. And, oh, it's just great. This place was so full of roaches. Oh, my gosh. And that's a story for another day. But we didn't have anything except our suitcases. And, you know, we were looking for stuff. And, 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 and this will all make a little more sense here shortly. But So we went down to the pawn shop. We walked down to the pawn shop because we didn't have a car. We walked a lot back then. I mean, miles. I mentioned TGNY in the last episode. We walked to the TGNY and bought stuff and walked back. It was like three miles. <laughs> it was crazy. But we were young and full of spit and vinegar, I think is what they say. But anyhow, the, at, at the pawn shop, you know, we didn't have a lot of expendable cash even at that. And at the pawn shop, we bought a used radio and a used television. And the television was a black and white television, and the antenna was broken. But um, that way, while he was gone all day, I could listen to the radio, or I could watch local television stations. And it was then, and that was back in 1982, that's when I was in, became introduced to Doctor Who. Because I could pick up the local PBS station, and Tom Baker was my first doctor. But the point of that little side trip there was was that, you know, I've I've been buying used stuff for a long time. Some of it because of necessity, because we couldn't afford brand new stuff. But anymore, and really as time has gone on, I, I just don't want, there's no point in spending money for brand new stuff. If, the, if a pre-owned piece of equipment or furniture or whatever will work. We shopped at the Goodwill store. We bought our... Uh, bedroom uh, chest of drawers and and bed frames and things at 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 a, pawn, at a not a pawn shop but at a thrift shop and our i can remember a coffee table that we bought and he stripped and we refinished and and had i don't even have a coffee table today but we had and you know that's just how i shopped at the time and that's that was some good sturdy stuff yeah it was from the thrift shop but it wasn't that chipboard what what we've got now is every is is to come back around to the kitchenware that I'm talking about is that I am a proponent of buying used. I don't like giving my money to China. And it's it's not because people in China don't deserve to make a living, it's because the government of China sends out of there to the world market junk. Junk. Uh, some folks get onto the topics of planned obsolescence on some things. And most of that stuff is coming up out of China. Or the circuit board is coming up out of China. Um, I've got a mixer that crapped out on me, a, a stand mixer, that uh, 
the the circuit board's cracked. I mean, if it was a fully mechanical machine, that it wouldn't have a circuit board to crack. But so what we've got going on now is is all of this quick, easy, lightweight junk for your kitchen. And being a proponent of buying used stuff, uh, you know, I'll sit there and think, you know, what what did people used to have that lasted? And the answer is flat out cast iron. And I know you can get new cast iron, and that's fine. But I, um, I, I have a an enormous, enormous amount of pre-owned cast iron. Some of it's Wagner, some of it's um, Lodge, some of it's Griswold. The Lodge stuff tends to be newer. I'm not a big fan of Lodge wear, but you know it's okay. But my ancestors used cast iron and yeah i know some of it can be very heavy i have a couple of pieces of griswold that is fairly light but it's still cast iron cast iron lasts some of the cast iron i have is over a hundred years old and it's still in fine working condition and the coating i mean it, it doesn't have a coating that's going to flake like teflon and you can give it to your grandkids if they can lift it. I mean, it is heavier than a iPhone or a game remote. So my my paternal grandmother had a small cast iron skillet. Oh, probably a six inch skillet, little tiny thing. And my grandfather, it stayed on, it stayed on the stove. My grandfather cooked eggs in it almost every day. My paternal grandfather, he didn't eat this newfangled crap. Now, he did eat margarine because that's what she bought. But he didn't He didn't eat all of this. He ate bacon. He ate eggs. He ate his, his eggs cooked in usually Crisco because that was, at the time, that's what she used. She didn't buy lard because it, you know, it was hard to get and, um, uh, in the, at that time. And, um, you know, Crisco was supposedly better for you. But, so he, he, but grease he just generically called it grease and of course she kept bacon grease and stuff but um he kicked he i only saw my grandfather my my paternal grandfather cook a couple of things one was his eggs and he would put them in that cast iron skillet and he would use a tablespoon and he would spoon hot grease over the top of the eggs so it come out kind of looking like an over easy egg but he never flipped it he didn't like them flipped so the inside the the yolk of the egg was nice and fluid the top of the egg was white it was cooked but it wasn't the edges weren't brown you know and it didn't get the the yolk didn't get hard and he had his toast with butter and, or margarine and his bacon uh, and the only other thing that I that I saw him cook was um, a meal some some it was it's cornmeal cornmeal and salt boiled in water hot water obviously boiling water um, just until it starts to get thick he then takes it off the stove lets it cool sets it in the refrigerator overnight and slices it and fries it like fried cornmeal and serve and, and eats it with butter or molasses now he was a big fan of molasses and he he it, he it was called corn mush m u s h but he pronounced it with an r so he pronounced it corn mush and it was weird to hear him say i'm going to fry some mush but it was good, and I make it every now and again. And I, I don't quite get it right. And I don't. May, and maybe it was the difference in the types of cornmeal we were using. But, um, and and you can get it at the grocery stores made commercially. I think it's called polenta, maybe. And it's in the refrigerated section. It's in a tube. It's usually got. Um, it's a. I think polenta is the Spanish version of corn. I don't know what, but corn something. But it's not the same. It's like anything else you get that's commercially packaged. It's just not the same. It's convenient, but it's not the same. But 
you know, I get it. Cast iron is heavy, and and today's under forties, they don't want heavy cookware on their glass cook stove tops. Heaven forbid if they have to break a sweat or their ulna to cooking their almost meat burgers by trying to lift a cast iron skillet. But you know, cast iron cookware is the absolute best, and if you use it properly, properly, cast iron rarely sticks. You know, I can cook scrambled eggs with cast iron with very little, if or no, sticking at all. And you know, the thing is, you just don't rush. You can't be in a hurry. You want to heat the pan all the way through. You can't just throw it on and have it heated in in three or four seconds. Like, I mean, I have some. St- some copper bottom Revere wear stainless steel pans which you know they heat up really quick they really do but you don't do that with cast iron you let it heat through because it's thick uh, and you know you can actually crack it or warp it if you don't heat it properly and if you don't let it cool down naturally if you take a hot cast iron skillet and, and dunk it in your dishwater it may crack it's probably definitely going to warp and you'll know it warps because it doesn't set level on a on a flat surface but and you know i hear people say but you you can't wash it oh my god don't wash you you most certainly can wash cast iron and you should wash it i mean you don't want crap growing in it you know you can rinse it out or you can wash it and i'm in with detergent i use detergent with my cast iron it's fine you can't soak it you know, you don't soak your cast iron. You won't ruin the seasoning, which is the the surface buildup that happens as you use it regularly. And it helps develop that non-stick capability. But you can wash it. You don't want to use a, uh, any kind of metal scrubber like a chore boy or a Brillo pad or something like that to scrub it clean with because that'll scratch up the seasoning you want if you have a little sticking issue you can use a um, some of those uh, soft scrubby nylon scrubbies or those um, oh they're some of them are green and some of them are brown they're there's some kind of a uh, artificial uh, oh shoot scotch brights scotch brights a brand name uh, pads you can use those they even ma- they actually make a little chain mail looking thing that you can put in your cast iron and swirl it around to help clean it up um, if you have a, something that's really stuck so you really screwed up something you put it in there with no oil you can put a little water in it and heat it up to a simmer and let it soften that up and then scrub it out of there but the case to you know you just have to get it completely dry when you do that and and so if you you've let your cast iron cool, you've drained off any grease that's in it, you've put it in your warm uh, dish soap, uh, dishwash water, and with detergent, and you you've scrubbed it up, then you need to take a towel. You you know you drain the water off, excess water off. Take a towel, hand t- dish towel, dry it as best as you can, and then you put it on a hot burner until the moisture that's still there has evaporated. Because you want it completely dry because, hello, it's iron. It will rust. Then you want to take, and I use Crisco. And I know a lot of people freak out about that. I don't like to use lard because it tends to go rancid sooner than Crisco. And But if you're using your cast iron regularly, it's not going to happen. It's not going to go rancid anyway. So you want to take take some Crisco on a paper towel and uh, just kind of wipe the inside of your cast iron skillet or pot if you're using a pot and you know sometimes you're going to want to wipe the outside of it too usually the outsides take care of themselves but um, you wipe it with that give it a few minutes to absorb into the oil or not oil oil into the pores of the skillet then after it's cooled down again wipe off any excess and then store it away what happens is when you heat the pan to evaporate the water the metal is expanding a little bit the um, 
the Crisco that you're wiping it with after it cools down just a tad. It still needs to be a little warm, but not, not to where it would burn you to touch. The Crisco you're wiping with gets down in those pores, and as it cools, that metal contracts back down. And that's what that's how it can crack if you have these extremes in temperatures. And anybody uh, who does any kind of welding can talk, can talk to you about cast iron. Can you weld cast iron? Yes. Is it a nightmare? Yes. You don't want to eat anything that's been welded on anyway like that. But then, I mean, it's just, yeah, it kind of sounds like a lot. It is a lot harder than throwing it in a dishwasher. Don't ever do that. Didn't I ever put your cast iron in a dishwasher? Oh, my God, no. So, but, I mean, honestly, it's not going to flake. It's not going to kill you, you know. And you can build up some of those pectoral muscles or something. Heaving it up and down. My mom had it. She had to have it. Oh, my gosh, she had a skillet. I swear that thing was 14 inches across. It was a monster. But you can't lift it. I mean, it would take, you know, a a 28-year-old bodybuilder on steroids to lift that thing. She had to have it. She couldn't lift it, but she had to have it. So it's, it sounds harder than it than it really is. Um, the key, like I said, is to get the oil uh, on the pan while the pan's warm. And then when you're cooking with it, heat the pan before you put in the hot pan cold oil. When you're talking about oil in cast iron, that won't cause it to warp or crack because you're just dropping it in in the top of the pan. What can cause it to crack or warp is putting the whole pan hot into something that's much cooler like your dish dishwater. But, you know, I talk about it a little bit. Uh, I do some cooking with cast iron. and I do a lot of cooking with cast iron, but I've got a little bit on my YouTube. I'm going to do some more on it. And uh, if you want to look me up on YouTube or Rumble, subscribe there. You can watch when I when I do some, some cast iron cooking here in the future. You can look at some of the other stuff that I've got on there, too. But now, look, don't forget, this is the 14th episode of the Hosting House podcast, premiering on the Fountain Network. If you found me on Fountain, I hope you'll boost, clip, and share with all your friends and followers. If I bring you value, I hope you will give me value. And I hope that my talk just now on cast iron was a little valuable to you. And I'd love to know of some of your experiences. Do you Have you ever tried cooking on cast iron? And would you be willing to if you thought you could manage it? Because you can get the small skillets. You can start with those and then you don't have to worry. You know, if you if you end up not liking it, then you just got the one small little skillet. You can use it as a decorative piece and tell people you use cast iron. <laughs> Okay, I got another piece of tarp for the chicken run. It had a white one uh, it, over about a quarter of it. So the the chicken run itself ha- has an open piece where, like, there's um, there's fencing on the sides, but not across the top. And then there's an area that has a what a lot of people use for for a dog kennel which um, is the aluminum uh, framed piece with the top and the sides and the door and all that stuff. And that part had a small um, tarp over half of it. So if you had used it for a dog kennel, you know, half of it would provide shade and the other half would provide sunlight and stuff. But um, I took an old piece of tarp and put over the front half of it of the framed part that has the roof on it because I'm, I'm hoping I got it. I'm, I'm anticipating some snow plus the rain. If I can, if I can divert some of the rain, uh, to keep it get just gets so just wet in there and it doesn't dry that quickly. Um, so if I can divert some of that water, I am hoping, um, to keep it down and especially the snow from their feed. Uh, chickens and chickens are subject to frostbite so this this it, the run serves both the chickens and the ducks because you know I don't have that many I've got seven chickens and I've got three ducks two of those are female 
but you the chickens will get frostbite so you want to keep down the moisture in the coop itself and you want to keep down the drafts in the coop itself but you want your chickens and your ducks to to get out to get exposure to the air the fresh air to the daylight you know and the, and just to help them with be more healthy so you don't want water or feed inside the coop and this is this is how i do mine i there's no actual feed or water inside the coop um, these are obviously grown chickens these are not chicks because chicks need access to water and food all the time you know especially if there's no mama chicken there to walk them outside and you know teach them the ways of the outside world but it 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 helps to keep your coop dry to keep that water out of there and it helps reduce the draw on uh, to vermin mice and rats to come into the coop now if you're putting straw down you know the straw is going to have some seeds in it anyway and that's going to that's going to you know be a draw to vermin in and of itself but you want to reduce that plus the feed will mold and uh, the dampness will cause mold in the coop you j which is just bad for them to breathe and it's just overall bad there's enough moisture in their excrements in the manure th to deal with you don't need to complicate things by having water and feed inside the coop I do have uh, oyster shell inside the coop in a um, it's actually a, a, cu a little tiny uh, automatic feeder it's a cat food feeder it's just a little tiny one it's not even eight inches tall and you put bulk well it's designed for cat food you put bulk cat food in the back and but I use it for the oyster shell I put the I, I fill it up full of oyster shell and then they eat it you know and then as they as they need it um, and then I don't have to fill it up that often but it doesn't contribute anything it's not a draw for vermin and it's not it's not damp so um, that's I, that's why I don't mind keeping that inside there um, and like I said you want you want your you want to force the birds to go out especially in the winter get outside the the coop itself and get some fresh air and sunshine now my ducks uh, they don't like the snow that much but they'll go out in it and they'll even play you know in their in their bath water they'll even play in it when it's icy but the chickens hate it they hate the the snow they hate the, to go out into the run they would stay in the coop 24 7 if they could when it snows but they need to get out and get some fresh air and sunshine so adding that additional tarp I hope I hope should help reduce some of the snow buildup last year the coop was in a different location and that's why I kind of don't know what's about to happen there uh, and it was really a sad setup I mean I was doing the best I could do but it just was really bad the chickens were happy they were fairly healthy I mean you know but uh, it just it just it looked awful it was in just it was bad <laughs> so I was really happy to to get the coop moved and to get that additional piece um, so that the the run itself would would function better and again if you've if you've subscribed to my YouTube or rumble you'll see the new setup because I've done some videos on it <clears throat> one of the rain barrels uh, just about fell over I have um, uh, a couple of those big black um, pickle uh, barrels from oh my gosh 10 12 years ago I don't remember now uh, that I converted into rain barrels to catch rainwater and um, one of them was starting to lean pretty bad and it was full and I couldn't move it uh, they're setting up off the ground on some uh, concrete blocks so that I can get a hose onto the spigot and then I can use the hose to divert water down to either the garden when it's in season or down to the uh, uh, the chicken run where the uh, uh, duck uh, water is where they can swim so 
it, it what I ended up having to do is we had a spell where there wasn't uh, rain for a few days and I was I emptied and refilled the uh, the duck water a couple of different times and that drained that barrel enough that I could move it but you don't think about those things what was happening uh, is that um, when the barrels were getting full and of course you've got a little you usually have a little hole up high so that when they get too full the water starts coming out um, the water you know they would get too full well that was kind of washing away some of the uh, the uh, soil around the cinder blocks that they're up on and um, it was starting to lean a little bit so I just had to adjust it I I want to move those over to where the chicken coop is and I know what it sounds like that's not what it would be I want to make some kind of like a gutter system on the the roof of the coop so that the water running off the roof of the coop will fill the rain barrels and then I can have a float in the duck water so that as it gets to a certain as they splash it out or it evaporates and it gets sort of low then it'll automatically let that rain water fill that and I'm not constantly having to dump and refill it and I would need to put I still need to put a uh, spigot on it to excuse me for stretching um, a spigot on it to drain or a plug a plug is what I mean so that I can drain the barrel without having to dump it because right now I have to heave it over and it's a nightmare to heave it um, I, it's also not level so I've got it I've got a couple bricks under it to keep uh, under one side to keep it level and so then I have to heave it around those bricks and then they sink and then all oh, it's all this stuff you got to do but I tried when I originally got the ducks I tried a couple different types of pond setups and it didn't work very well um, they would fill up where, but where I had them at that time they it was getting mud run off run into them I, I might be able to redo that again this spring I'll have to think about it some more but with Christmas coming so fast I probably won't get it done oh a couple weeks ago squirrel squirrel a couple weeks ago I saw a gray squirrel out back uh, it, you know have you ever heard people say that squirrels will bark squirrels will bark at you so I was hanging out some towels so it's it's been back before it got too cold to hang clothes out which some people say it's never too cold to hang clothes out but for me there there can be days so I was hanging some uh, bath towels and stuff out out back on the clothesline and the squirrel was barking at me and I thought well, I haven't heard of it. I haven't seen a squirrel around here and I it's been ages since I've seen a squirrel around here years I think even because there's just not very many squirrel in this general area it's probably because of the cats I think cats will eat a squirrel I mean they are a rodent I don't know I have to ask somebody but so I decided I'd get a squirrel feeder and I did get one uh, on clearance at um, I think it was at the Walmart and I got some of those squirrel corn things and I, I got to get those in a container to keep the mice out of. They're probably all over my back porch this morning. But only thing, only the place I had to put that feeder was on on the what's left of the fence post out back, and it's a metal fence post. So I can't. Well, I guess if I had the right kind of screwdriver drill bit, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Uh, I could have put it in there but I, so I just ended up using zip ties I, I strung some zip ties together and managed to to put them around the feeder and snug it down and through the fence enough that even if it wobbled it couldn't actually hit the ground but and then I put that feeder up and uh, I'm going to see what happens I, I might regret it <laughs> I, I like the idea of having some squirrel around um but I, I may regret it because I, well, I can't shoot them too close to other houses to shoot them. I, I don't guess you trap them. and But I don't know. They're good for the ecology, I think. They're part of, part of nature. Part of nature. So we've still got a few open dates for Holstein House uh, as far as reservations. I did get down to St. Albans. Uh, I was talking about that last time. I did get down to St. Albans to pick up some Coal River coffee. 
and I spoke with Rachel, the one of the owners of the Coal River Coffee, um, and she runs the the coffee shop, and she likes to do all the baking and stuff. And I was talking to her. I purchased two pounds of their wild and wonderful whole beans. I will be able to uh, grind those. I have a I have a manual uh, coffee green bi- grinder. And it really doesn't take that long. I have an electric one as well, but I don't like it. The noise it makes, it's, it's a high-pitched noise, and it's just awful. And the, it doesn't grind coffee beans evenly, so I can set it even at fine or espresso or whatever it is. And it's still not exactly what you'd think. But that hand grinder, it grinds, it's a very uh, even grind. I really like it, so I'll be able to do that. And I, I'm going to find a little... Uh, I was reading about espresso pots and um, how they work and how they're different than um, pour over or percolator because I have a, a stovetop percolator and I have made coffee in it before. It, it I don't have one that you can see the um, color of the water, so I can't judge really without looking, uh, taking it off the stove and looking down in it whether the whether the coffee's ready or not because you just you set it on top of the stove it's not electric i have an electric one it's an it's a a vintage six 1960s era coffee pot but i don't have the um cord i ordered a replacement cord for it and got the wrong size and i, I haven't been able to fi- find one to fit it um i think it's westinghouse i think that's the brand name but it's the same pot you see in the movie um, Hidden Figures. So, I, I mean, I know what kind I'm looking for, but I, just, I can't find the right size. I had thought I did, but I didn't. But anyway, so I'm looking into trying to find a pre-owned espresso pot that you put on the stove. I've seen those somewhere and I just didn't realize what I was looking at so you these um, these pots they set on the burner some of them are not made for gas so I'd have to I have to find one that's made for a gas burner and I'd rather get it pre-owned than new but I may end up having to get it new if I want to do it you set it on the burner and it kind of works like a, a percolator except that the pressure the steam builds up in the base so in the base you have some of your you have your distilled water and then you have your beans in their filter and then you put the top on and instead of the water boiling up through the tube and splashing down over top of the grinds the coffee grinds you have the the steam being forced up through the beans so what comes out of the tube is is the coffee or the espresso I guess and um, well no it's still coffee because espresso is just the technique so instead of the hot water going over the beans and dripping out the steam is going through the beans and then condensing in the tube and bubbling out into the top pot and then that top pot's where you pour your espresso from. But I want to try that. I want to be able to offer, uh, well, now, I, I like my drip coffee. It's just, you know, put the beans in, pour the water in, boom. And I've got a, a home um, grade, a household grade bun coffee pot. So it's always got hot water in it, so it doesn't take very long at all to get it. Uh, I have the percolators. I have... A Keurig. I have a really old Keurig. I got that Keurig back, wow, probably, let's see, I left the conservation agency in 2007. I uh, started freelancing right after that. I probably got that in 2008 or 2009. And it actually was almost nothing. And it's a really top-end model, but I got it through Staples, the um, the um, business supply store. It was a promotional deal. If you order X amount of stuff, uh, dollar-wise, then the curry was 
half price or maybe even less than that and I needed a case of paper so the case of paper hit the dollar amount and I, I ordered that and I got the this really nice curry uh, it has three uh, three um, cup sizes you can choose from it holds quite a bit of water I mean it's just really nice um, I have a cheaper one too that I got at a, a um, at a thrift shop for like I don't know, five bucks I needed I had to take the filter out of it somebody it, it they had used the regular filter on it and um, water filter and I had to take that out I had to get that old water it still had old water in it I had to get the old water out of it and clean it obviously but it works just fine too and I got it for four bucks like I said you can find you can find stuff and I have it at my other office uh, on the other end of the property um, I'm not over there very often which is sad let's see oh so I, I, I got the wild wonderful beans at Coal River Coffee and I've talked to them about getting some some small gift packages of, of it's either two or four ounces Rachel wasn't sure she said because her husband took care of that I've reached out to him waiting to hear from him back on getting some of those so that I can offer um, gifts who direct book a, a gift pack of the um, wild wonderful beans or or coffee uh, I think maybe that would be ground and um, some Hall's chocolates. I also was able to stop by the Hall's chocolate uh, shop at the Capital Market. I didn't get the chocolates that I wanted, and I got them last year. I, they're they're a box of four, and they're pretty expensive <laughs> for a box of four chocolates. But as a as a a gift to my direct book um, guests, it's worth it to me to to get those and but what happened this time is when I went up of course I wasn't dressed real fine because I've been working in the yard and stuff I don't know if the woman thought I was just trying to steal something or not uh, I also bought some uh, some uh, garland and wreaths for outside so I, I wasn't I wasn't dressed for success in the office so she she came so oh, can I help you because I was looking at them I said yeah I want to get some of these and um, I was wondering if you had them packaged for with hard hard candy instead of the caramel filled and and different uh, flavored filled ones. And she says, "No, our what are, are, is this for uh, Christmas? Is it?" But I said, "Yeah, it'll be it'll be for gifts." And she says, "Oh, you can't you don't want these which were the filled chocolates now." And I said, "Really?" She says, "Oh, yeah, they'll go bad before Christmas." And I thought they'll go bad before Christmas, but they're sitting on the shelf. She said, "You want you want the hard chocolates, and we don't put those in the gift boxes." I said, "Do you sell like boxes that I can make my own?" And she says, "No, we don't do that. It's kind of snobby, but they're awesome chocolate. They really are." So what I ended up doing was buying a a couple of um of the um their suckers, their hard chocolate on a on a candy stick. Christmas themed I really didn't want Christmas themed because I want to be able to use them throughout the year not just at Christmas but that's okay and I bought a couple of bags of the hard chocolates that I will I'll just have to put a little gift set together myself some way um, getting a little I, you can order boxes I just hate to do it like I said I don't like to put money into that kind of stuff but you can get little candy boxes and I can I can set those up myself and do those for my guests so my guests will be able to have uh, the direct book guests now these are not Airbnb book guests these are direct book only they'll have um, uh, a little treat of a bag of um, wild wonderful Coal River coffee and a little treat of Hall's chocolates from West Virginia and if I can learn how, I'll be able to make espresso or cappuccinos for them. <laughs> so, let's see. Where am I at now? Oh, last week was the first Sunday of Advent. The service was a little lumpy. I tried to explain the history of how we arrived at, at the four Sundays before Christmas Eve. And, um, you know, it, I, I didn't deliver very well on it. I mean, 
the, my style of delivery was really kind of sad. But I was kind of fascinated at the process that the Christian church went through from about 400 AD to present day, refining the timeline and the activities into the things that we do today and how we observe Advent and the preparation for the return of Christ. Um, it probably would have been better for a Sunday school lesson, but m at my church we only have the one, the one service now. But I do want to share with this, share this with you a little bit today. Um, yesterday, and I, as I'm recording this on Monday morning, which I apologize again for my timing. Um, yesterday was the second Sunday of Advent, and um, I want to share with you this this piece of the service that I did. Uh, yesterday defining the season of advent that it comes from the latin word adventus meaning coming or visit and it begins four sundays before christmas and ends on christmas eve and this is in in the protestant church of which i'm affiliated i know i have a couple listeners who are not in the protestant church and that's okay i don't have any problem with that at all and they do their christmas season a little differently uh, for us, Advent is the beginning of the church year, and during Advent we prepare and uh, we prepare for <clears throat> and anticipate the coming of Christ. We remember the longing of the Jews for the Messiah and our own longing f for and the need of forgiveness, salvation, and a new beginning. And even as we look back and celebrate the birth of Jesus in a humble stable in Bethlehem, we also look forward anticipating the coming of Christ as the fulfillment of all that was promised by his first coming. And during during Advent in in my house, <laughs> we light candles on the Sundays before Advent and there is usually a, a some sort of a reading and this being the second Sunday of Advent we would light two candles. Uh, and we would say we would we would recite this they will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of knowledge of, of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the people. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. We are the followers of that root of Jesse Isaiah spoke of. We are the ones who are now called to stand as a signal to the world to all of creation that peace is the will of the one who created us peace is the knowledge of the Lord that we proclaim from sea to shining sea and in those days John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near and bear fruit worthy of repentance we light these candles the candle of joyful hope and the candle of proclaimed peace in part to remind ourselves that we are the people rising toward God's promise, but we also light them as a sign to the world, an announcement that there are some who hold on to hope and there are some who work the ways of peace. We stand as a sign that Emmanuel is still our fervent prayer. And so I'm going to leave you with that as far as as far as the show uh, with only a couple of other things remaining. The date is set. Toolman Tim Tuesday will be tomorrow, December the 6th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to try to live stream it on my YouTube channel and the Holstein House Facebook channel. Uh, I'm still learning with StreamYard, so it c might get a little clunky. If I booger it up and it goes off, just, you know, hang around. It's going to come back because there's been a couple times that, that I've, I've hit something and it just canceled out the, the broadcast and I had to go back in and start over again. But it's going to be at 8 p.m. on Tuesday, December the 6th. And that's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Now, for two, Toolman Tim and his wife, Becky, it will be 6 p.m. because they're on Mountain Time in Canada. Uh, oh, 
and you know if you're traveling again if you're traveling through west virginia along the turnpike west virginia turnpike which is interstates 64 and 77 combined uh, consider looking up holstein house if you need a spot to stay uh, on your travels it's it's very convenient for a lot of folks that are traveling it's a halfway point for many people and um, just a good spot to stop if you decide to book mention that you heard of the pot heard of me on the podcast and i'll try to add a little value to your stay maybe a little extra chocolate or some homemade cookies or something i pay with bitcoin and i might give you a little discount too so that's a wrap for episode 14 of the hosting house podcast twice now the hosting house podcast has been in the top 50 on the fountain fm fountain.fm network and i love you guys for helping me achieve that uh it might only last for a day or so but all the same it's great and i want to thank uh euphrosinos again a, a dedicated supporter of the program uh 1995 sats some excellent comments and a little discussion on uh, uh, Euphrosinus uh, recent I guess you say conversion uh, I haven't asked a lot of questions to see what you know the, the previous religious position was or, or wasn't um, Euphrosinus commented that uh, they're a new convert in the Antiochian Syrian Orthodox Church uh, in communion with the Greek Orthodox Orthodox Church. So it's very interesting to hear uh, some of the differences, not only in our religious beliefs, but in our cultural beliefs as well. And I, I encourage you to share our comments and, and help me understand where you're coming from as you listen to the program not just your physical location but how you grew up and how things compare to things that I recall um, you know there, there's also the remembrance of, of I mentioned TGNY and TGNY was you know a, a, a discount store in the southern part of the United States and it was familiar to uh, other listeners so you know, feel free to comment. It's okay. I, I don't have any problem with that. So your patience is continually appreciated as I stumble my way through this and uh, and get my um, skills built using the podcast. So there you have it. Post your comments, do all that boosting, liking, sharing, thumbs up, and stuff that helps spread the word and poke the algorithms. Follow me on most of the big social media platforms and look for my name, Robin Holstein, or Holstein House. Till next time, bye-bye.